Hello, everyone. Happy Pride. Welcome to Save the Date, your dating survival kit from Coffee Meets Bagel. I'm Down, your host and CNB's Chief Dating Officer. Today, I'm joined by Ariella Soror, a queer dating coach who is on a mission to disrupt traditional dating advice and transform the dating pool into one we enthusiastically want to jump into. I love the mission, Ariella. It's so in line with what Coffee Meets Bagel is trying to achieve, which is totally. to give everyone a chance at love. Like, I definitely want to ask you about how you came to create that mission, which is um, really inspiring. Ariella is not only a dating coach, she's a certified life coach, registered yoga teacher, and is currently receiving a graduate advanced certificate from Columbia University's School of Psychology in Sexuality, Woman, and Gender with a concentration in LGBTQ issues. In her practice, she helps, quote, kind queer folks navigate the dating landscape so they have the courage to go after what they want in dating and in life without feeling overwhelmed or exhausted. Close quote. Thanks for joining, Ariella. My pleasure. I'm so happy to be here. I know that's a mouthful to read. <laughs> you did great. Great. I really am curious about your mission statement, which like when I first read, read it, I, I thought it was so inspiring. How did you come to uh, come up with the, the particular statement? I feel like there must be a, a you know, good backstory. <laughs> totally. Um, well, how I came up with this statement is really how I came up with my practice and what it is that I do. And basically, I had gotten my life coaching certification and I was trying to figure out like, who do I want to help? What's the change I want to make? And I knew I wanted to help queer folks, people, anyone in the LGBTQ plus community. So it was like, what, what do those people need? What am I qualified to do? And it came to my attention that dating coaches existed. Mm -hmm. I hadn't previously known. And I have always been obsessed with dating. I have a very interesting background with it, but people in my life know me as like the person that dates. So I was uh -huh. like, hmm, let, me, let me look into this a little bit more. And I found in my research that a lot of dating coaches out there spoke in language that wasn't applicable to queer folks. It wasn't mm. applicable to folks that weren't cis women. It was very exclusive and based on like really strict heteronormative ideals right. that were kind of taught to feed into. There was a lot of like psychological manipulation, of right. like how to get him to text you back, like that kind of thing. And the more I read it, I was like, wait, we got to tear down this whole system and rebuild it from a place of integrity and personal values and clear mm. communication and gender free, anti oppressive as much as possible dating advice that's actually inclusive to everybody that wants to be included instead of inclusive to to an elite few. Yeah, I love that. And the the thing I really like about that approach, like value driven kind of um, yeah. dating advice is that it really will be applicable to everyone it doesn't matter you're queer non-queer like you're straight yeah. right because it really is just totally. driven by personal values instead of the the norms and expectation that's been formed um in this heteronormative society that we live in absolutely um, and, yeah and so i think you know for our listeners whether you're queer or not um i think the conversation today is going to be applicable for all of you because of that um Let's kind of step back. Uh, and for those of us, you know, we have a, all kinds of daters listening. Uh, for those people um, who are not familiar with queer dating, um, could, could you explain a little bit more about what it means to be queer? What kind of identities and experiences, in your opinion, falls under this category? Yeah, so when I say queer, I'm using queer as the umbrella term right now for everybody that falls under the LGBTQIA plus spectrum. Now, some of those folks won't actually identify their sexuality as specifically queer. They'll, they'll mm -hmm. be like, I'm part of the LGBTQIA spectrum or I'm bisexual and they won't use the term queer. Queer is sometimes just like a shorthand for anybody who is not cis and heterosexual. Everybody that's not cis and straight can kind of fall under this umbrella. So often I'll say queer or queer and trans, um, particularly because sometimes binary trans people don't identify as queer as a sexuality. So it's kind of everyone who's not cisgender and straight. Right. And cisgender means uh, uh, identifying with the sex you were born when you were, the, the sex you were given at birth yep. um, and its corresponding gender. So if you 
were assigned female at birth and you feel like a woman, you're a cisgender person. Yep. So that's uh, a little pivot if, you're, if yeah. your listeners are unfamiliar. Great, great. Thank you so much for that um, fund- basic fun- uh, explanation. <laughs> Um, let's yeah. go back. Let's go back to kind of what you alluded to in the beginning. You know what what you observed. A lot of dating advice and tips based on it was very heteronormative kind of um, dating advice that's not applicable to um, or it doesn't speak to the queer community. Could you kind of delve into some some of that, like give as an example, and how you've kind of I don't know if modification is the right word, but um, how you how your current approach is um, different than that? Yeah, for sure. Um, I think so. For for an example, kind of like I mentioned before, there is the like I I see a lot of ads and a lot of dating coaches out there who are particular, usually straight white men, telling women how to act in order to get men to pay attention mm-hmm. to them. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of like a lot of dating coaches. Obviously, you have some amazing exceptions on this podcast, mm-hmm. um, but. Uh, a lot of the dating coach industry when it's like that is kind of interwoven a bit with pickup artistry. Mm -hmm. There's so many overlapping tactics to get people's attention. Um, So basically I like to ignore all of that and start from exactly like we were saying, like values based. And instead of trying to figure out what you can say to get someone to text you back, it's more like how, how, why can't we just say what we want to say? Or how can I say the thing that I want to say in a way that it will be best received? Or how can I get consent to have a conversation that feels a little awkward? Or how can I approach someone and really understand if they're interested in me without trying to check for uh, like and pick up its indicators of interest that are like, okay, three check marks and I can ask this person to go home with me when Mm -hmm. we're not really acknowledging that even what we understand as check marks, what we understand as indicators of interest, oftentimes are the way that we've been socialized to behave, right. especially as women. So it's kind of like, I, I like to look at the broader sense of um, how can we communicate well, regardless of what we're going after and who we're talking to, how can we show up as our fullest selves in that way? And how can we question everything else? Right, right. Yeah. So um, you know, this reminds me of a few episodes ago, I was talking to, I've, you know, I forgot which dating coach that I was speaking to, but, um, how these kinds of stereotypes, um, that about dating and what, what, Mm -hmm. you know, men should do, women should do, blah, blah, blah. Uh, some, a lot of times actually end up sabotaging our own dating success. Um, so I have a lot of, for example, female friends who are kind of waiting for, their, uh, you know, the straight female friends of waiting for, uh, you know, their male counterpart to take action, like ask them out, right? Um, totally. and, and because, I mean, they don't, they have no problem um, asking them out, but they also feel, uh, again, because of the stereotypes that are associated with uh, dating, that um, they're, they're going to be misunderstood as somebody who's desperate or too aggressive or whatever else. And so because of the fear, they end up kind of acting in accordance with the, um, the stereotype that's been assigned to a totally. uh, straight woman, for example, uh, which I don't think is very healthy or, or um, you know, for both men and women, um, totally. and, you know, how, how liberating, right, would it be if all of us could just kind of speak up our mind uh, and uh, feel uh, free, have the freedom to be able to do so? Yes, totally. Because if not, then we are continuing to perpetuate the system and perpetuate stereotype and gender binaries and whatnot when and we'll pass that down then if your if your friend winds up getting with a guy in that way what what are their kids if they have kids going how are they going to see the world you know as opposed to trying to really tear this down before we start putting ourselves out there then we can really move from a place of values it's one of the first things i do with clients is get Mm. clear on what their values are so that I'm also not projecting my own values onto mm-hmm. their onto their dating experience, right? Yeah. So I'll get clear on your values so that we'll we'll make your dating profile born from your values and send your text messages from your values and, and mm. figure out how you're gonna approach someone you're interested in based on what you believe in your values. So I think that that is kind of our that can be our North Star when in instead of kind of the societal boxes that are usually mm-hmm. our North Stars and we politely stay inside. Right, right. 
Actually, one of my questions was going to be, what are some of the most common challenges that your clients uh, come to you for help these days? Are one of them communication? Like we're, we're just now talking a lot about communication and how I think in dating, whether or not it's uh, because of stereotypes or uh, something else, because you're you're kind of nervous and of course you want to make a good impression and you don't want to make a mistake. Um, communication in general is just challenging. Yeah. Uh, and, and then the, the stereotype, of course, adds more complexity to it. Um, so I'm curious, would, is a communication a big issue that your ch- uh, clients come to you for? Yeah, sometimes. I'd say communication is up there. A lot of my practice is based on self-understanding, like mm. under, understanding yourself and your desires and what's going on for you, and then learning how to express it in a way that other people can receive. So mm. yes, a lot of people come to me for communication. Um, and it might also be because that is kind of what my work is geared towards. Um, so sometimes communication is like, yes, sure, like writing dating profiles or, or you know, having a fuck buddy that you want to have a serious conversation with and now you've developed mm-hmm. feelings. So it's like, mm-hmm. how do I say those things? Or how do I tell my partner I want to, the person I'm seeing, like, how do I tell them that I want to be having sex more? Or, you know, how do I ask out the person that works at the dispensary I'm really interested in? So sometimes yeah. we can learn communication in that way. Um, but another thing is that I specifically have folks come to me for, I have a lot of people in their late twenties mm-hmm. who have prioritized career mm-hmm. who are now like, Oh, I guess I should have started dating. Mm. Like I feel a little late to the game. Mm. Um, I haven't really put much effort into this. I was really focused on my life and setting it up. Um, or I have folks that came out after, I mean, we say came out later, but there really is no timeline. So I'm putting that in air quotes for the people listening. Um, but sometimes that could even feel like you came out later when you came out in your mid twenties, mm-hmm. as opposed to high school, where for some reason you're navigating the dating pool in a different way and you want more support doing that. So it's mainly folks come to me if they want to learn how to date better. Um, if they've been dating and it's not feeling aligned for them or it's not going in the way that they want it to or they want to learn how to date period and they either have never dated before or are new to dating in a particular pool, be it a queer pool or a non-monogamous pool, anything along those lines. Um, that's, that's mainly what folks reach out for. I see. Let's, um, you know, the, the, I find that more specific we can get into the more helpful um, it is for our daters. So, you know, you mentioned some, some of your uh, clients, they came up quote unquote later in their life mm-hmm. or they, they feel like they, they did. And they're kind of uh, starting to date in the queer community for the first time. What are some tips for those of our listeners who are in that pool? Um, what are some tips that you could do, you know, or words of encouragement you could share with them? Mm-hmm. Totally. Um, one, that there is no late. You're perfectly <laughs> on time. Uh, we're happy to have you. Um, be gentle with yourself. There is a lot of learning that will be happening. And a lot of, uh, sometimes the question that comes up is like, how do I figure out, I know I'm queer. I know I'm new to being queer. I don't want people to feel like I'm experimenting with them. Mm. And I also am not exactly sure what I like or who's who appeals most to me and whatnot. Mm. So I would say to get, one of the things that I talk people through is feelings-based standards. Mm -hmm. So to get really clear on how you want to be feeling around someone you're involved with so that like in your last episode, we can ignore, we can kind of let race and sometimes gender for queer folks. We can allow type to all fade into the background and we can really question what we've been Mm. taught in that way and we can go out with lots of different people and see like how am I feeling around this person Mm. Um, so I would say to focus on how do you want to be feeling around the folks that you are going to date then under like in the moment being like "Hmm, how is it that I'm actually feeling when I'm out with this person and understanding if you are on your queer journey it's okay to learn as you go Mm -hmm. I think a lot of us have the fear in our head that um, we're going to hurt people or there's Mm -hmm. a lot of tropes out there of like straight girls making out with their queer friends at parties and then being like, oh, I'm so straight, you know, Mm -hmm. tropes and like so many of us have have been there, myself included. Um, (laughs) But it's, it's because of that, a lot of us feel inhibited to actually like try and put ourselves out there because we aren't 100% clear on what it is we're looking for. And I think that is probably the biggest thing to tell Mm. new queer daters, 
you don't need to have 100% of the information as Mm -hmm. you enter into the dating pool. Mm -hmm. You can really guess, be kind, be transparent about how things are going for you and learn by doing, not learn by um, researching and trying to have it all uh, Mm -hmm. figured out first. Yeah. Because like a theoretical kind of understanding is different than actual practice. Yeah. Would you say it's important for, you know, um, those of us who are starting this for the first time? And, you know, you mentioned like, I want to make sure that the other person knows that I'm not experimenting, that they're not being experimented on. Uh, But, you know, at the same time, I'm I'm also like trying to figure myself out. Do you think it's important that you be transparent about where you are at? Yeah. So I think this is largely up to you. Mm. because you need to know in your heart of hearts, you're not experimenting. Mm-hmm. I think mm-hmm. that if you know that it, and if it's not impeding like in your last episode about like the elephant in the room, if you're able to be present with this person and you're not like, Oh God, like I, I didn't wind up saying that this is the first time I'm going out with someone like this mm-hmm. and whatever. If you're able to be present, I think it's totally up to you. Your past is your past. If you know that you're queer and feel comfortable in that your past history does not dictate what you need to share or not share as it relates to newness. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're in a sexual situation and you're feeling confused or not present or like you don't know what to do and you're being really taken out of where you are because those thoughts are in your mind, it's totally cool to talk about it. If that's, yeah. if that's drawing you away from the situation. I don't think there's a hard and fast rule here. It's whatever right. feels authentic to you and allows you to be present. Yeah. And, you know, this almost uh, reminds me of, you know, sometimes we get I, get, I get questions from daters, like, you know, do I communicate this tricky situation that I'm in? Like, for example, um, I am a divorcee. Like, when mm-hmm. is the right time for me to actually share this with my date? And then, and, you know, I give the same exact advice, like when it feels authentic to you. Yeah. And if you find yourself boring, like, I feel like I should, then there's something there, um, you know, wh- for whatever reason, yourself is telling, there's something there that you need to look into. Um, and uh, so kind of ask, like, why do I feel this way? And if there's some legit reason, yeah, go and do share. Um, but it totally. really has to feel authentic to you. There is no right or wrong answer here. Um, and I, I guess kind of going kind of going back to the whole reason why you are dating with uh uh, practice dating coaching practice is based on personal values. Yeah. And, and so what, and what we're talking about here is really the question of disclosure. When do I disclose a certain right. thing about myself, which is really common also as it relates to gender um, relates to trans folks when they disclose, if someone on a dating app doesn't know, and also really big as it relates to disability. Mm. So these are all areas in which you have to kind of see like, how has this worked for me in the past? what allows me to feel most present, what is safest logistically. Um, yeah. And so, so it's, it's a complicated issue and, and a really, really personal one. Yeah. And then you, you also have to be, feel good about the fact that like, you know, um, the, the relationship is such that it doesn't feel, it feels authentic and it feels good mm-hmm. and it doesn't feel misleading. Like if you, if you're constantly asking yourself, Oh my God, I'm not doing it. Just like, just, just pause. And, um, and it requires, I think it warrants like a close observation. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, also the other takeaway that I kind of pulled from your, what you shared is for, particularly for those of us who are kind of exploring this for the first time, um, mm-hmm. it's import, important to be introspective, right? Uh, so totally. that, you, cause yeah, cause you're figuring it out and, um, you know, each interaction, I'm sure there's going to be a lot of learning that we take on about ourselves, about what we like, um, so, you know, that seems like the, uh, one of the key lessons. Totally. I think being introspective is, is spot on and assessing how, how it feels in the moment. If you need to like go to the bathroom and get some water or remove yourself from the situation, or if you have like um, something that you play with that makes you feel really grounded in the moment, like anything that allows you to be like, okay, this is where I am and this is how it's going for me. And um, I think all of that is a super important part of the process. Switching gear a little bit, you know, we talked a lot about heteronormative norm and expectation and how like a lot of times that really like sabotages our own dating success. Are there expectations and norms that exist in the queer community that you observe that it's just, uh, you know, uh, 
getting in the way of our dating success for our queer daters? You know, there, I've been asked this before, there is not like overarching themes in this way for me so far in my work. And if there are, a lot of it is still pinned back to social structures and the way that we've been socialized. So if anything is showing up that's really inhibiting queer daters, it's kind of still the same things that show up mm. that inhibit uh, straight daters. Or, or it could be like internalized homophobia or things along those lines where someone still has some, um, some barriers to transcend to be really comfortably out. Or um, there are problems like being out to your family and wanting to date and wanting your partner to feel supported, but there are certain family members that, that aren't aware. So so that sometimes comes up, but I would say um, for the most part, it's it's the same kind of communication things that come up with everybody and where gender roles and, okay, you know what? There is one, there's one oh, that great. comes up. <laughs> there's one that comes up and this is when, what <laughs> I was on a podcast and someone called this getting stuck in the chat. She's Australian, the podcast host. And she's queer and she was talking about how sometimes she'll be on a date with someone with a woman and she they will both be talking so much and they really want to make a move mm -hmm. and neither of them are able to kind of move through making a move because of our socialization in that mm -hmm. way of like quote unquote men are supposed to be making the first move so she talks about like she finds herself just keep getting set, stuck in the chat, stuck in the chat. Mm. So, so it's like, how do we actually transcend the physical mm. barrier between us if we can tell that someone's interested? Um, so I'd say that's probably the one, that's probably the one thing that has come up multiple times um, where I see people need some guidance. Uh, yeah. be, beyond that, it's a lot of, um, there, there's less of a question, there's more of a question mark around how we're supposed to show up and more kind of creativity and fluidity in social roles when we're showing up in a queer way for the most part. So it's not super binary in like, I have to wait for this person to text me because <laughs> they're this gender or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, so I'd say stuck in the chat, the one, the one that I do see come up. Let's talk about that because that I'm sure um, a lot of us um, who are listening you know, some of us at least I have run into the situation where I want to make the move, but I really just don't know how because of the socialization. Yeah. Um, any help you can provide there? Um, okay, there's a few things. One, so so first it depends if you're like reading the other person, like if that other person seems really interested, or if they seem like you can't get a read, or if they seem not interested, right? So we'll kind of like yeah. approach all of these in different ways. If if you can't get a read, sometimes it's nice to like cross the physical barrier, not to touch them, mm -hmm. but to move closer to their circle and see mm. how it affects them. Mm. So sometimes that's an easier way of like, even like there's a menu across the table if we're not using QR codes, but like, <laughs> you know, something that like my, my hand is going into your space and seeing like, did something feel buzzy there? Mm. Did they, did they stay where they were? Like were their mm -hmm. hands resting on the table as you got closer? Were they kind of like pulling back and, and sitting upright. So it's kind of noticing how people are responding to us. Mm. So that's one thing to do. Another thing, if you're like in a place where you would, it, like in this example on this podcast I was mentioning, um, she was at her apartment and this person was over with her. So right, that's a totally different situation, but they sat on opposite sides of the couch. <laughs> so that would be a matter of like, first getting your bodies closer in space. So that could be like, do you mind if I sit closer to you? Mm -hmm. Or it could be one of you going to the bathroom or like if you go to the bathroom and you come back and you choose to sit closer and see how that feels. It's a yeah. lot of like testing and recalibrating and noticing and then voicing if things right. are, you know, going right. So, um, and then the, I'd say the last thing is just to literally say, I'm thinking about, like, I'm thinking about kissing you. Can I, can I kiss you or mm -hmm. can anything, any variation on a consent based theme of like, I want to do this thing. Is that all right with you? Um, yeah. Which I think is always a safe way to handle a first kiss if you are nervous or you can call it out. You just say, yeah. wow, I'm so nervous and I really want to kiss you. Yeah. Oh my God. How cute is that? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> it's so I adorable. think it's like okay to name, like we could just name more of what it is that is actually going on inside of our bodies yeah. and normalize that like we don't need to pretend to be like ultra confident, <laughs> sure daters 100% of the time. It's not yeah, realistic. because who really, who really is, right? Like exactly. I mean, maybe, maybe like, you know, very, very unusual, you know, 0.001% totally. of people, but I mean, I certainly can speak for myself. Like I'm totally like a rack when I, uh, you know, when I was dating, mm-hmm. especially in the early days of dating, it's like, um, yeah, I'm just like so nervous. Totally. And, and, and the tip that you gave, like, I think, especially when it comes to physical kind of um, uh, physical move, consent is really important, right? And it, mm-hmm. that, that tip is so, and that's why safety is so important and, you know, making sure you have a good read on the, the person is important mm-hmm. and, and calibrating and making small steps. Um, and that's, that's such a great tip for uh, anyone, anyone who's dating, yeah, totally. um, straight, queer, whatever. Like uh, if you want to make a move uh, physically, like th- that's, um, you know reading is important and if you feel like you I I, I think you should err on the side of like confirming uh, and you know 100% certainty uh, yeah. when it comes to this by actually naming it and asking versus yeah. kind of jumping the gun when you're un- unclear what's going on with the other person yes I also there are great non I just took a great nonverbal consent class mm. um, so if you're someone that is confused uh, about like, how do I read these skills? Also acknowledging sometimes based on neurodivergence, if someone's autistic, like it can be really, like really challenging for folks to actually read what's going on with other people. So totally normal. And there are a bunch of resources out there to help us to learn how to read other folks better. Or you can always name like, I'm having trouble like gauging how you're feeling in this moment. Mm-hmm. Like, would you mind cluing me in or letting me know or whatever it is like we can we can practice speaking up in that way too yeah I love that can we go back to the uh topic of like th- those of us who are kind of exploring this uh, for the first time and mm-hmm. I, I'm not like um you know how can I get get more comfortable like I love the specific tip you gave here about you know what we can communicate and so if I'm somebody like that and I'm dating for the first time I feel like and I'm at a point where like I feel like I, I want to share that I'm 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 at this stage uh, that feels right to me um, but mm-hmm. I don't know how to express that like how how could I do that so so just to make sure I'm understanding your question the question is how do I actually tell someone that I am dating for the first time Mm-hmm. because because I want this person to have the information yeah like I I'm kind of like dating the queer community for the first time and like it's I'm new new here and I'm, I'm trying to figure out what I want kind of thing mm-hmm. so I'd be curious about the context of mm-hmm. the conversation first so it's a little hard to kind of like jump in there like if you're mm-hmm. on a date with someone um like if you're dating someone casually and uh it's going well and you're not feeling ready to like be in a committed monogamous relationship yet because you still feel like there is more learning to do for yourself on your queer journey. Mm -hmm. I can see that being a situation where you're like this, you know, I, okay. So then how you would have that conversation is first you would get consent to have Mm -hmm. a difficult conversation, see if the other person has space for it um, or has time. Um, Then I would, could I, can I bring something to you or something like that? Yeah, totally. Exactly like that. So if we're, if we're hanging out, I might be like, I have something that I've been really feeling called to share with you. It mm. might require a little bit, it might be, it might be difficult to hear. It might not be. Mm-hmm. Um, it might require a little bit of um, emotional work. Mm-hmm. Maybe not, but it might. Um, mm-hmm. Do you, it does now feel like an okay time to talk about mm. this or would mm. you rather wait till after dinner or as you're walking around, what feels comfortable for you? Something like that. Um, I mean, that, that was kind of a long winded one. You could just be like, I have something yeah. kind of tricky to talk about. Can yeah. I, can I talk to you about it? You know, there's all these, yeah. I, I'm just in the camp of like name what is present yeah. and true for you. Um, yeah. But what that's, this is good because what it, it is like expressing what feels true for you. And it could look like long winded, like the example yeah. you shared totally. It could be something else. Right. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. There's no right or wrong. And so, yeah. um, you know, I think, I think there's a tendency, at least like for me, I was like, 
oh my god criticizing how I'm expressing myself because I'm like I'm babbling on shut up like what are you doing but really there's no there's no right answer <laughs> there's no right answer and so much so that you could actually be like wow I'm really babbling on to avoid <laughs> talking about this thing with you <laughs> I'm going to just, are we good? I'm going to start saying it. Is that okay? (laughs) Like there is no, this is all born in your own style of communication. We could totally name the tendencies we're noticing inside of ourselves too, that we're saying. I think that that's, there's no wrong here. As long as when it comes to having a conversation like this, I think the only, the only thing to do is to make sure that the other person is prepared to have the conversation with you. Great, great, great. Okay. So I did that. I got the consent and I, you know, I was told this is a good time. Um, so I might say something like, I am really enjoying seeing you. I uh, want to keep seeing you. And it feels like we might be moving towards partnership. And I'm not feeling ready for that stuff. I am new to my queer journey and feel like I have some more understanding of myself that I need to do before I take that step with someone. And I just want us to be on the same page about that. And I want you to have this information so that you can act accordingly and do what's comfortable and right for you. That might Great. be a way. Wow. It sounds so easy when I listen to you say it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? I would just think about what do you hope the outcome of telling this person is? I would get yeah. really clear on like, what is the intention behind giving this information to someone else? Right. If it's because like you're feeling guilty about it or you're withholding, like I would probably investigate that a bit more and be mm. like, okay, am I like, what, what makes me have to tell this person? Like my, my past is my past in that way. Like there, there are no hard and fast rules when it comes to like how we handle coming out. Yeah. In, in related to other things about your past, I wouldn't say that that's, oh, like sometimes you really should be sharing things about your past. <laughs> but but as, it, as it relates to your own coming out journey, there's no like, it's, it's, totally, it's totally up to you. But yeah. a lot of times people might feel more comfortable kind of like bringing it up on a first date. Mm-hmm. And, and that could look like, um, that could look like if you're going to get consent, it could be a little bit more um, like, I have something that might be awkward to share. You know, it might yeah. not be like a deep kind of thing where we're already seeing each other. So your consent can be based on, you know, what's actually true in the situation. So I have something to share. It might be a little awkward. I'm feeling inclined to talk to you about it. Is that okay if I share something personal? That yeah. could be the way that that consent piece looks. And then it could be like, I am, I am feeling awkward. I want to let you know this is the first time I'm actually dating in a queer way. I'm really mm-hmm. enjoying it. Nothing to worry about. I know I'm queer. I'm happy to be here, uh, but I'm feeling inclined to share this information with you. Yeah. I do like that. I, yeah. I guess I approach these conversations with a bit of a sense of humor mm-hmm. and like understanding that we all have shit and we all <laughs> have stuff that like we can share or not share that like it's okay and yeah um sometimes it's not that deep and we can you know get consent and be responsible and have hard conversations and they can feel less hard than we think that they might feel yeah yeah exactly you know I think like like I said like when you when I hear you say it like sounds super simple but when Mm -hmm. I'm um you know when you're actually in the situation just it feel it could feel hard because it's jumbled with our emotion right like we're feeling nervous and yeah. You know, I don't know how the other person is going to react and hopefully positively, but I'm worried about that. So it, it could feel more complicated than it actually is. Totally. So what I do with clients in this way is that I'll never give, like if you were a client, I would never spew something like that to mm-hmm. you mm-hmm. because then you're going to try to emulate what I'm saying right. instead of what's right for you. Right. So instead I'll be like, okay, this is, these are the bullet points you want to hit. You want to get consent. However, that looks for you. Mm-hmm. You will probably want to name what's going on for you right. that you want to share this information. You'll also probably want to name what your intention for sharing the information is or how you hope the other person will respond. Yeah. And then you want to say the thing. Yeah. And then sometimes you want to ask a question after. Right, right, right. So I'd say those, in that piece, those might be like the five steps. I'd yeah. Say. This almost reminds me of nonviolent communication concept. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. So for um, those of you or those of us who are uh, not familiar with the concept, it's basically a way of communication, a lot of introspection that has to go in before you actually communicate. So first you kind of make an observation about the situation. And then kind of like you said, am I feeling guilty? Like what is the emotion that's compelling me to actually share this? Like, so you kind of identify that and share that. Um, and it, it'd, be, it'd be surprising, like, because we're not used to being so introspective as to why we want to say certain things. If you start asking like, why, why, why? There's like so much that actually can get uh, uncovered 
that you may choose not to share, but it's like a discovery for yourself also. Totally. Right. And then the third layer is like, is there a need that, you know, underlying need that is, um, that I'm trying to be met with? Like, so for example, here, maybe I'm feeling guilty and maybe I need reassurance that that's okay. Like from the other person, like that, maybe that's what I need. And maybe that's why I'm feeling compelled to share for it as an example. And then you can kind of make the request um, if that's what you need, like, so that the person can actually give it to you if they, if they're totally. uh, feel inclined to. Yeah. Um, but, you know, when I, I remember when I first learned about that concept, like, it, I was blown away by the level of thought that's required for me mm-hmm. to, um, like, just to understand what I want, <laughs> you know? Totally. Totally. Yes. It is not always so simple, but yes, right. it is. Then I've, I've only know a bit about, I've taken like a class on nonviolent communication. So it's like in the soup of how I guide people. And I want to acknowledge that these words come out of my mouth very fast and these scripts and these tools feel familiar to me. And if they don't feel familiar to you, or if it sounds way easier in my mouth, that is totally normal. Mm-hmm. Communication is my bread and butter in this yeah. way. So this is what I really care about and work with folks on. So don't worry or feel <laughs> self-conscious. We are not taught to communicate in this way for the most part. And that, that is totally normal. And there are resources out there and we can, and we can learn how to, how to do it and incorporate it. Yeah. And it's, it's also about practicing, right? And you yeah. know, every practice is going to make it perfect. So first time you try it on, it's going to feel, you may even feel awkward. Like, oh, hey, I'm just like saying all these words. Yeah. And, and then you can even say that you want to, you could be like, I'm practicing express myself <laughs> in a way that's different than I usually do. So this might take me a moment to process. I really want to try to do this in the best way I know how, like, can you just hold space for me while right. I am figuring out what it is that I want to say, you know, like yeah. we can, we can add all of it. Like we can just have the human experience be part of the conversation. Right. And, and the thing that I think we often forget is like, you know, again, when I hear, hear you say that, like, I'm thinking like, if my date said that I'd be like, this is so adorable. And like, the fact <laughs> that this person is putting so much thought into what they want to communicate, like that's hot. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think a lot of times, um, I don't know, I tend to be self-critical. So then in my head, I'm like, okay, well, this is going to sound like babbling and stupid. Um, but, you know, I think when you, when we kind of turn the table around and think of ourselves, like our date saying that, I mean, it, it really is very um, endearing in a way, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I've never yeah, had a shows emotional mm-hmm. intelligence. And, exactly. I mean, that same like turning turning the frame around or turning the camera around or like how would I if I heard my best friend say this or if I heard my date say this how would I feel how much less judgmental am I of everyone else right. like myself you know those are all really important tools for dating too yeah yeah so you know I really hope the date you know all the listeners out there you know start experimenting with this because I can tell you from my personal experience even even when I when like the conversation didn't go um as articulate in my head mm-hmm. as I, I I hoped it never it was the other person was always so appreciative of my attempt to be transparent and thoughtful mm-hmm. and um, of sharing totally another specific question so I've heard about this biases that exist uh, in the queer community in terms of who's authentically queer especially regarding bisexual people so if I'm a mm-hmm. bisexual dater uh, how do I any tips on how I could deal with that Honestly, that's the same tips of how do we deal with any micro or macro aggression that we face mm-hmm. in the dating in the dating world in the world world. Um, it is it's true that I mean there are there is so much um, I don't want to say hierarchy, but so there are so many biases within the dating community, like you said, um, and I think it's on all of us to examine where these biases come from and try to unlearn those. And if we're finding ourselves having a conversation with someone who's bi and then having like feeling a type of way about it, that's on us to do the work to handle that. And it's on the people themselves who are bi and who notice that someone says something biphobic or who rolls their eyes when you say that you have an ex-boyfriend who is straight or whatever it was um, to handle the situation the way that they feel most comfortable mm. and to either allow those people to slip out of their dating pool and move on or engage the people in conversation. But I'd say it's, it's the way we handle anything that is um, a microaggression, right? 
Yeah, yeah. I mean, drawing, like being firm and drawing boundary, I think is really important here. Like um, if, yeah, and like making sure that you kind of, um, we, uh, I don't know if protect ourselves is the right word, but uh, just you know, not allowing those people to, uh, to get to us, I think. Um, yeah. It is kind of the word that I that that came to me. So yeah, you're right. Like whether it's this particular situation or any kind of particular right. situation with any kind of aggression, like do not do not um like just do not accept that. I think that's 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 yeah. the number one um important kind of uh, message that I would like to share. Like it, there, do not tolerate it. I agree, and I have a bit of um I have a bit. A part of my curriculum of the course I'm running now kind of talks about like how to deal with um, microaggressions on first dates and how mm. to navigate like a pretty awkward conversation after um, if someone said something that hurt your feelings, especially if you want to engage with them, like especially mm. if you're like, oh, I actually really like this person. I think that they could be better. Yeah. <laughs> um, like how do we, you know, call them in and grant them the grace to correct them if they're open to it or acknowledge yeah. that we don't have the space for that and we're not interested and, and move right. on. So one of the last topics I wanted to touch on is dating apps, of course, being Coffee Meets Bagel mm -hmm. is a dating totally. app. Um, and so, you know, right now Coffee Meets Bagel is currently working on being more inclusive in terms of gender representation. Um, our current setup, uh, for example, doesn't we don't have an option for trans people um, to, to be able to sign up, which is really unfortunate. Honestly, like I personally am embarrassed about that. But uh, the good news is it's being worked on right now. Um, first, could you talk about why this is so important for any kind of dating apps, uh, Coffee Meets Big or not, to have these uh, uh, options? Yeah, because people feel really excluded. Right. <laughs> it's important so that, you know, anyone who wants to date or use your service or support your business can actually do that. And um, yeah, it's that's why it's, it's really important. And, and it's, tough the dating apps can be really hard for trans folks and and hard for queer folks but um there are a lot of apps that are that are trying to do things differently or better and are handling it in in many different ways with varied levels of success um but it's it's important so that everybody that wants to be at the table can be at the table yeah absolutely uh, for those of us who are, um, you know, queer daters and are using apps that are not specifically that, you know, that are that I can sign up to use, uh, but that are not specifically targeted towards queer communities. So there's like all kinds, all, all types of people kind of involved. Um, any dating tips for, you know, there could be some situations that uh, gets created because of that setup. So any dating tips um, you could provide to for those of us who are using general dating apps? Well, it's interesting because my brain originally was going to, you know, tips for anybody on dating apps. Mm. The the parts where situations can really be created are, and I'm not sure what Coffee Meets Bagel's plan is, but there are basically two different ways that apps are handling gender at this point. One of them is that you can pick from a pretty, like a gender expansive list, what gender you identify as. And then you can, uh, on the other end, you can be like, okay, I want to swipe for, and you check off how many genders you want to be swiping for. So that's mm -hmm. one way to handle it. The other way to handle it is um, more what more common at this point, which is where you can pick your gender from a gender extensive list. You can choose to have it show on your profile or not, but then you still need to pick a binary gender mm. for which deck you're going to show up in which mm -hmm. is still a little bit problematic and can be dysphoric for um, trans folks who want to be on the app, but then still have to be like, oh, but I still have to choose if I'm a man or a woman, if they're mm -hmm. not binary and so on. Um, so I would say, um, regardless, what can be tricky here is that if you're on a dating app, like the second example, where you're a trans person showing up and you picked that you're going to be in the women's deck and then people are swiping on you and then either finding out that you're trans after or seeing that in your name and saying something hurtful, um, that can be really hard. Um, there can be a lot of um, aggressive, not nice things said in dating apps and in life in general. So mm. I think it comes down to, again, honoring your own boundaries, what you have space for. And sometimes it's taking a break from a dating app or um, leaning into meeting people in a different way because dating apps are just one tool 
and it could be turning up the volume on your communities and allowing friends of friends to introduce you if you're if you find that putting yourself on dating apps is putting you too much in the line of fire to be harassed or hurt then Mm -hmm. it might not be where you feel best um but hopefully there are great people out there on dating apps too and it's just a matter of conserving your health and your mental health and your Mm. mental bandwidth and doing what feels good for you and not what feels harmful for you and getting the support you need when things are hurtful right um Thank you for that. I see that our um, time has flown by. Um, <laughs> Ariela, so th- this was really an informative discussion, um, even for myself. Uh, so thank you so much. You're welcome. If, if our listeners want to you know, stay in touch with you or interested in your coaching practice or whatever else is uh, that you're up to these days, how do they stay in touch with you or learn more about you? Yeah, so you can follow me on Instagram at Queer Dating Coach. Um, that's also my website, queerdatingcoach.com. Right now I'm running a course called Date Better Bootcamp, which is like a four week intensive of everything that you would know, need to know in order to learn how to date or date better. Um, I'm not sure by the time that this airs, I might be starting sign up for the next round. I might be in between rounds. So mm-hmm. if that's something that's interesting to you, feel free to shoot me a DM and kind of ask where I'm at in the process. If it's not clear based on my social media and I'll get you on a little priority invite list. And um, yeah, we'll see if it's a fit moving forward. Great. Um, Awesome. Uh, And my last two quick questions that I ask, um, well, actually just one question that I ask every day, uh, say the day guest, what is the best dating advice you've ever received? Received. Trust your gut. Mm. I guess it would Mm. be that. I can tell you my why I love dating and my mm-hmm. biggest piece of dating advice if you want to hear that <laughs> yeah please I love dating because I never take for granted how impactful a brief moment can be on my life and I think mm-hmm. that you you feel kind of similar based on what I've heard you talk about that it's it's kind of allowing all of these moments to be learning and to be life lessons and yeah what, what there is to receive from an interaction that isn't necessarily dependent on whether like success isn't like I end up with this person or I don't end up with this person. It's like, yeah. what, what did we give each other here? How did we impact each other here? And how have I changed because of our time together and allowing that to be success too? Yeah, I love that. And, you know, I think dating is great because we all need love, right? We, we mm-hmm. need a sense of belonging and connection. That's such a fundamental, it's, it's our, it's our, it's like an oxygen for, I think, human beings. Mm-hmm. We, we just can't totally. survive without that. And to your point, also like to try to make relationship work, however serious or casual it is with another person who is, you know, who has a completely different background than um, you do and, you know, upbringing and whatever else. And to figure that out, um, it, it takes so much work, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, but and in that process, there's so much learning that comes with it. And I, I think that's why dating makes us a better people. Mm-hmm. Totally. I completely yeah. agree. Okay. So just one, one more thing. Like I actually hesitated to add, um, ask this question or not, but I want to practice our own, uh, you know, practice what I, we just uh, preached, which is like, okay, just name it. And if it's awkward. So mm-hmm. I, I hope this is not offensive. Um, but I, I thought maybe this could be helpful because I do hear from, um, you know, my queer friends who are dating in this, like, you know, speaking of the regular, like a more mainstream, like non-queer specific apps that people use. And sometimes you can, you can get hurtful remarks from mm-hmm. people who found out that, you know, if you, when you share that you're trans or something like that. And, um, you know, I think education is really important here for, you know, you know, how does it feel to be on the receiving end? And like, how, I, I think about what kind of tips we can share uh, people who are, um, you know, they've been matched and they found out that the match is transgender. And, you know, if it's not, if you're not interested in pursuing, how do you actually kind of communicate that in a respectful manner? You don't have to be harassing, right? So um, could, would you be willing to talk about that? I could talk about it a bit. First, I would, but more than that, I would, I would encourage you to investigate what makes it that trans people are excluded from your dating pool. It's the same thing. Like I, I treat that like race as well. 
that mm. like we disguise a lot of preference as actual pretty deep seated bias. Mm -hmm. So um, if, if you are on that journey and if you are going to take intentional time to be like, hmm, why did that feel, why am I feeling like this is a no all of a sudden? Mm -hmm. um, I would, I would encourage you first to do that work. That's such a good I would point. I would worry less about like how do I tell this trans person I'm not interested and more mm. like what makes me not interested? What mm -hmm. have I been taught about trans people that would make them excluded from mm -hmm. my dating profile? Right. Um, and I would probably surround yourself. Sometimes it's a comfort thing and I would probably like follow like get on social media and search like trans activists and trans models and um trans resources to have a better understanding of what it is that you might not understand so that people aren't excluded so much from your from your dating pool in that way yeah and, and you know whenever it comes down to you know um exclusion whether it's uh this you know the sexual identity or race or whatever else like one thing that i really emphasize is the more exclu uh, one yeah like you know, ask, ask yourselves why, right? You know, all of us have biases. And, um, and so, you know, we need to really investigate. And the other thing is like the more exclusive we get um, on things that are what I call kind of superficial, um, mm -hmm. like the checkbox, checkbox yeah. things, doesn't matter if it's is it education, is it race, is it sexual identity. Totally. Um, the, the, the less we are able to really kind of, uh, uh, I guess, assess, if you would, um, people on qualities that really matter, which are things like values, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so uh, that's something that is really important for us to bear in mind, because again, I think because we do that a lot, it kind of gets in our own way of dating success in, in, is my personal um, view. And I, I see that a lot and was, uh, you know, speaking from my own personal experience as well. Yeah, totally. And and also from the dating app perspective, apps have kind of a history of banning trans people on dating mm -hmm. apps because mm -hmm. someone reports them or, mm -hmm. you know, and that's all trigger responses from the people reporting them um, because they don't know how to handle their own discomfort of something that might be new or whatever it is. Right. So it's, it's like, how can the system of the actual dating app itself make it so that there is a little bit more that goes into banning folks on dating apps? for being who they are versus, you know, saying something yeah. um, homophobic or transphobic, you know? Yeah. So it's, it's kind of on everybody to question, to like pause if you're like, this is a no for me and be like, where is that coming from? Mm -hmm. and is that something I need to actually work on more yeah. than um, keep my dating pool exactly the way that I thought it should be? Because you don't know what's right. on the other side of that. It could be yeah. amazing. Yeah. So well said. Um, thank you so much, Ariela. This was really informative. You're welcome. Do you have, do you know when, like, when we can be looking out for more gender inclusivity on CMB? Uh, I don't have the exact date, but it's coming okay. up pretty soon because I know our product team has been working on it for a while. Great. I mean, the unfortunate, I guess the thing is we, just to answer your question, we kind of, the first path that we're taking is the latter option that yeah. you described. That's how most folks are doing. Yeah. And part of it is because like, if we do the first way, we're just afraid that there's nobody that they can choose, choose. like we can't actually show yeah. anyone and totally. so until we actually get a, a good community of people signed up I think unfortunately this is the way we can get around to being able to show people totally. yeah but you know I do think about the you know the thing that you mentioned about the reporting mm -hmm. um, and you know I know that's an experience that's that's fairly common and so I think there needs to be a system that um, and, and you know, it's not even just that, like people report other people for random reason. Oh, they ghosted me or whatever else. Totally. Yeah, yeah. So we need to give people better tools to be able to classify certain reports so that we're not like auto banning um, just because somebody yeah. got a lot of reports. Totally. And then, um, yeah. And then the other thing is, I think there needs to be some like education around um, this topic also. For sure. And I'll, I'll also say like, even when doing this, the latter, um, if, if there's a space like for pronouns, that's really helpful. Or if you were to add that to the, I hope it's okay that I'm kind of giving my, oh yeah, yeah, please. Here. Is that okay? Yeah. Um, if you were to add a, an area for pronouns on the app, cause, cause I had thought, I had seen that there it's not, there's no gender. Like you can't type in your gender and there are no pronouns on CMB. 
if you were able to add in um, a gender or, or end or pronouns, probably end, um, and then allow folks who don't know what that is to like cook a little information I and then open that up and then have um, a resource on what why you've decided to include this, um, what the hope of mm. including this will will do for CMB and for the greater community and um, what pronouns are and why it's appropriate to use pronouns and, and all that stuff. If there's like you, you can help in the app um, do some of that educating itself. Um, so hopefully that, that helps a little bit. Yeah, that, that definitely helps. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, all right. Well, it was so nice meeting you, Ariella. Let's keep in touch. And I'll yeah. definitely let you know when we actually do launch those gender options. Perfect. That sounds yeah. great. Can't wait. Okay. Thank nice you for being you. on the show. Of course, my total pleasure. You're, you're absolutely <laughs> lovely, and I totally respect everything that you're doing. So, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye, Ariella. Okay, talk soon. Bye.